Imposing and majestic, these stone slabs were placed mysteriously on a mountain in 1980 by an anonymous group. The words inscribed on them seemed innocent at first, but some theorize that the words actually have an evil meaning. Was this monument truly just an innocent marker meant to help humanity, or was it inspired by a much more sinister purpose? This week's episode is The Georgia Guidestones. In the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I've never been to Georgia. Drove through it. Hmm. I don't know if that counts. I think I know I've dr- driven through it. I also don't think I've ever. I flew been. into it and then drove out of it. Okay, but I never like spent a. I feel like I would like Atlanta. It seems nice. Yeah, I think I've driven through it on the way to Florida. I'm sure, but I can't recall staying there. Although I feel like. Maybe for a night or something I have. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I love the southern landscape of, Mm -hmm. like, big oak trees, uh, the big colonial-looking homes, and just all that type. So I think I I would like parts of Georgia for sure. We landed there to drive to Knoxville, and it's a lovely state. We stopped at a Chili's just outside of Atlanta. you know what? what? Chili's is good wherever you go. Presidente Margarita. Tasted oh. just like home. <laughs> yeah. Those, uh, I think those taste the same wherever you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. But yeah. That, I, this is, this topic this week is one of my bucket list things I want to see. Well, I was, yeah. I, I had never even heard of this. And you mentioned it a while back. And then a listener, or maybe it was a Patreon, messaged, um, a couple weeks ago suggesting this as well. And I was like, oh, this is ve- a very close thing. Mm-hmm. That uh, that we the can world visit. Is ending. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, I meant in proximity to where we live. Like it would be oh. easy to go visit. <laughs> but true. also, I was like, "Huh, this is really ringing true right now." <laughs> With, <laughs> How may- should humanity behave? Maybe we should all flock to Georgia and uh, take a look at what's going on there. Pray to the old stones for yeah. answers. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting for sure, and um, I learned a lot. I did, as did I. My favorite part is just the uh, the interviews that I saw with the folks from this area. With the Georgia they locals. Reminded, they reminded me of my kin folk in Tennessee. Oh yes, yes, they're a, a similar. I don't want to say breed because that sounds <laughs> insulting, but <laughs> similar it's a, similar colloquialism folk. Yes, of the yes, area. Yes, but I like I love. I mean, we're from the south, but. We don't have as much of like a drawl as Mm -hmm. Georgia does, but I love a good Georgia accent. It's Mm -hmm. uh, especially like if it's just right on a man. mm, Oh, yeah. It can sound (laughs) like that's that's a painted drop off. (laughs) (laughs) It's very nice. My cousins roll. They're real, like, kind of similar, but it's, like, a little more northern, and it's, like, a pocketbook. I can't find my pocketbook. I think a lot of people not from the U.S. think that we, that you and I speak very southern, which I take umbrage. No, we don't speak that southern compared to... We really are not. uh, ...to what people that are really, really southern sound like. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I talked to a friend of mine from law school that's the real country, and he goes, well, Heather, I told you. I mean, yeah, it makes you realize. I'm like, I'm not. Now, I do have relatives that sound like that. 100%. 100%. 100%, As does Tommy. But when you live in Dallas or a major thoroughfare Mm -hmm. for a while, you grow up there, you kind of kind of get away from it some, but there's been a, a meme circulating that Paris showed me, and it's a graph of cool on one axis and Texan on another axis. And then it's plotted each Texan city. And like Austin is very cool, but not very Texan. And like Lubbock is super Texan, but not very cool. 
they had Dallas right in the corner that was neither cool nor Texan. And I was like, hey. <laughs> well, we got shit on on both ends, didn't we? I know. I was like, damn it. I, also, think that we're, I think we're Texan and cool. I think we were, they had us like right in the corner, right at Who zero. Who is they? The government? Uh, whoever Who made this? this meme. Some dickhole that made a meme. <laughs> yeah. But I, I would say Lame we're at least. Lame media? Yes, exactly. Fake news. <laughs> we would be a little bit up, a little uh, too up and too. Are over, we as cool least. as Austin? Nah, Austin's Not the coolest close. city in Texas. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Are we cooler than Lubbock? I lived in Lubbock. I went to college for a while in Lubbock. Yeah, was actually even born in Lubbock. Oh, knew who knew who I did, and my yeah. parents both knew too. <laughs> your mother Lots was of there. And your father actually had yeah, that I was born there. <laughs> Are is Dallas cooler than Lubbock? I guess cool is subjective. Is there more of a nightlife here? Yes. Is it more liberal? Absolutely. But Lubbock has a really nice small town college feel and Mm -hmm. the whole city is centered around Texas Tech. And, you know, I when I went there, I went there because I wanted to go at the time to a big Texas football school. And have fun at the games and stuff. Yeah, not the best motivation for where you choose to go to college. (laughs) I would like, they're like, what is it? Like the on-campus life? Is it the education? It's like, you got tailgates? What kind of (laughs) dual tailgates? You got got PBR? What's going on? Have you been to the place there that sells the cheese logs? I believe it's Um, called Speedies? Girl. (laughs) It's called, shit, what is it called? Slappies? Spankies. Something like that. Spankies. Spankies. That's the one. That's the one. They are so good. Nuts. The last time I was in Lubbock was 2006, and I still remember oh, that Oh, my log. God. We, I mean, there was a Spankies not too far. Now there's one right across from campus, but this whole shopping center did not exist when I went to school there. But one of my friends who lived in the dorms was a waitress there. And so oh. we would go, and she would hook us up. Oh, my God. You dip those motherfuckers in ranch. Mm, they're so up. good it's like fried cheese but way bigger yeah and it's just like better. the size of a corny dog yeah it's huge oh they're so good yeah have i had it yes also they've of got course. one of the best grilled cheeses i've ever had if you're in mm. lubbock or close by go to spanky's it's so good get you that cheese log. you'll get to see the campus if you go to the one right across the street from it so yeah well, that, all that being said, uh, fuck that meme, because I think we're <laughs> the meme both, is rude. <laughs> both cool and Texan. I think so. I think we're pretty cool. Like I said, we're not. It's like if Austin is Greg Brady, like we're not the littlest brother. Was Greg you the know, cool one? He was the cool older brother. So if if Austin's Marsha, yeah, then we're are not, we Jan? Yeah, for we're sure. Cindy. We're Cindy. No, we're not Cindy. Cindy was cooler than Jan. You think so? Yeah, I mean, she was younger, but I think she, if given, like, uh, you project her into Jan's age, I think she would she's, have been cooler than Jan at that, of Jan's age. Cindy wouldn't have to make up a fake boyfriend named George Glass. <laughs> That's so, so great. Now, I will George say Glass? we're not Marsha. Austin's okay. Marsha. Oh, always. Yeah. Honestly, I just want to be Alice. So where do I move to, to be <laughs> Alice? <laughs> I think Houston's maybe Alice. Oh, Houston would be a good Alice. I lived in Houston for a bit, too. Also a nice, nice place to live. Well, if you live in Texas, Georgia, or wherever, welcome. We welcome, we, on our meme, you're all cool. And you're all yes. wherever you're from is what you're you are. You're the most of that. <laughs> well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Looming over an otherwise deserted hill in the northeastern Georgia town of Elberton are five slabs of polished gray granite, each standing an impressive 16 feet tall. The slabs appear to be arranged in a star pattern, with a 25,000-pound capstone resting atop. Known as the Georgia Guidestones, the monument is reminiscent of Stonehenge in England. And while the mysterious rocks across the pond have been one of the world's greatest mysteries for centuries— The Georgia Guidestones have been baffling onlookers since the early 1980s. It's very American to look at a classic thing like Stonehenge and be like, we can build one of those. (laughs) Get you some rocks from the quarry. I know a guy. He's got a quarry behind his house. You want quarry? I can get you quarry in in five (laughs) minutes. You need some granite? Gotcha. Called the strangest monument in America by Wired, the Guidestones are shrouded in mystery, beginning with how did they get there? A town of about 5,000, Elberton heralds itself as the granite capital of the world, as it is home to numerous quarries and wholesale granite companies. 
One such company was the Elberton Granite Finishing Company, owned by Joe Finley. Finley was used to fulfilling wholesale granite orders for gravestone companies. So when one Friday afternoon in 1979, a stranger walked into his office and asked about a custom order, Finley assumed the man was looking for a headstone. Instead, the stranger, who introduced himself as R.C. Christian, told Findlay he represented a small group of loyal Americans who wanted to build a large monument. Anytime someone introduces themselves as a representative of a small group of loyal Americans, I just that's not going to end up well. End up well. Imagine fedora, sunglasses, trench coat. Yeah, <laughs> so shady. You're like, what's under the trench coat? Yes. Who are you? Let me see some ID. Lots of questions. As Finley listened to the man's lofty plans, he was shocked. Christian was asking for a monument to be erected out of granite slabs larger than Elberton had ever produced. Not only that, but he wanted them to be flawlessly cut and polished. Christian's plans revealed that there were to be four upright granite slabs, standing 16 feet high each, with another slab of granite placed across the top. In addition, the group Christian represented wanted words and numbers sandblasted into the sides of the granite. In disbelief, Finley asked the elegant gray-haired man before him what on earth this was for. Christian explained the structure would serve as several things, a compass, calendar, and clock. He went on to say that the granite slabs needed to be able to withstand any global catastrophic events that may occur. As Finley understood it, the purpose of the stones would be to help survivors of such an event reestablish a new and better civilization. The words and numbers Christian wanted engraved into the slabs were to act as a set of guidelines and instructions for building a new future. Well, again, the next thing, I represent a small group of loyal Americans. This needs to withstand global catastrophe. <laughs> You're like, uh, <laughs> there's the win. A lot of red flags just ding, 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 happening this right off the bat. I make gravestones. And he's like, this is a sort of gravestone, a gravestone for humanity. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, God. Yes, it's the largest gravestone you will ever build. No, no. Years later, when an Atlanta reporter asked Finley what he thought of his first meeting with Christian, Finley bluntly said, I was thinking I got a nut in here now and how am I going to get him out? According to Wired. In fact, initially, Finley didn't want to do business with Christian and tried to discourage the man's plans by quoting him an exorbitant price for the project. Christian, however, didn't so much as flinch at the price and instead asked if there was a trustworthy banker in town. Seeing this as his opportunity to unload the man on someone else, Finley sent Christian to Wyatt Martin, president of the Granite City Bank. It's a good friend. Yes. Uh, it's also <laughs> a good name. Wyatt Martin's a good name. Uh, I am a huge Wyatt Martin fan. <laughs> Wyatt Martin, he is a man of his word. And I love this guy. He's got a um, tenacity and will about him that few do. I, when you know a secret, a real juicy secret, oh man, and you're willing to just die knowing that, that I don't think I'm capable. Oh, I think he enjoys it. The look on his face is just what my mother would call old shit eating grin. I yes. mean, he just loves the fact that no that everybody would love for him to spill but wouldn't but and that's fun but also at some point aren't you like i gotta tell somebody what, what i if know you just you like blurt it out in your sleep yeah <laughs> yeah or you drop a can of chili on your foot and you're like da, da, da. like you just say the name and they're like what name was that you're like i don't know it was a book i was reading i don't know finley called martin to give him a heads up about the mysterious stranger headed his way telling his friend a kook over here wants some kind of creepy monument, according to Wired. Martin, however, took notice of the expensive suit Christian wore and how educated he sounded when he spoke. Knowing this man was serious and most likely had money, Martin took the man seriously. The man before Martin told him that R.C. Christian was actually a pseudonym and that he and his group preferred to remain anonymous. When Christian explained the plans for the monument, plans that he said had been in the works for the past 20 years, Martin told Wired, I just about fell over. I told him, I believe you'd just be as well off to take the money and throw it out in the street into the gutters. He just sort of looked at me and shook his head like he uh, felt kind of sorry for me and said, you don't understand. You know, 
this is where you're not going to go into a banker in any other state and be told, you know what? I suggest you just go throw your money out in the gutter right now. If you got such a cockamamie idea as that. That's it's why like, the South is great. It's just great investment advice. No, they don't. You they cut right through the bullshit. They tell you what you don't want to hear, but what you need to hear and what everyone <laughs> else is thinking. You just bundle up the money and shove it up your ass. <laughs> like, okay, thanks. And he's just like, but then he's like, you don't bitch. understand. <laughs> you, you fool. You pee picking mm-hmm. fool. Christian left Martin, telling him he would be scouting locations for the monument over the weekend and would be back Monday. Upon returning, Martin told Christian he could not move forward unless he knew the man's true identity. Christian agreed under several conditions. First, Martin would act as the sole intermediary of the project and help find some land upon which the monument could be erected. Second, Martin had to sign a confidentiality agreement, promising never to speak of the details of the project. Lastly, Martin was to destroy all evidence of the project once it was complete. Martin told Wired that the man that called himself R.C. Christian was very serious about secrecy. He said he was going to send money from different banks across the country because he wanted to make sure it couldn't be traced. In 2010, Martin told documentary makers in dark clouds over Elberton. The one thing I assured him, I would never divulge who that family was. That's power right there. I, I mean, he's he's. I like that he signed a confidentiality agreement, and it rarely comes up. I mean, he's never like, "Well, I'm contractually obligated." It's just like a total man. I gave him my word. And yes. That's all that's important. No, he's, also, he's a man of his word. Can't you wouldn't be able to enforce that confidentiality agreement? What are the damages? That's kind of what's interesting to me is that R.C. Christian is willing to trust this man that he just met uh, supposedly. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and yeah, like you said, a confidentiality agreement, that's not going to stand up in court. Is it even Mm going to go to court? Because then R.C. Christian is going to be outing himself and his group (laughs) in a court of law. (laughs) So it's kind of all just, you know, smoke and mirrors to make him feel better or whatever. It makes me think of uh, who's the guy, the crazy, uh, who's the guy, the um, McKamey Manor guy. He made people sign the confidentiality agreement that's a million pages long. It's like, you'll pay us $50,000 if you say. It's just like, what are you going to really do? Really? Yeah. You're going to take me to court? Really? Before Christian left, Martin asked, why Georgia? Christian said that he had done his basic training in Georgia and that his grandmother was from the state. Martin also pressed Christian why he selected Elberton of all places, besides the obvious granite production. It turned out that Elberton was actually Christian's second choice. Nearby Hancock County actually had a better alignment with the sun, but because of an overgrowth of trees, Christian couldn't find a good place to put the monument. Plus, having the stones manufactured and set up in Elberton meant Christian would save money on freight. I like that they're a cabal of wealthy Americans, but they like a deal. Hey, (laughs) who doesn't like a deal? Free shipping? Everyone likes a deal. After squaring things away with Martin... Christian once again met with Finley, this time giving him a shoebox that housed a wooden model of the structure he envisioned, plus ten pages of detailed instructions. After that, Christian bid Finley farewell, telling him, You'll never see me again, according to Wired. When a $10,000 deposit from Christian was received the following week, everyone got to work on this monumental project. Money's in the bank, who cares? Everyone was kind of like, this isn't going to happen. What are, we'll just entertain this kook and see. But then that money comes in. They're like, shit, all right, I'll get my quarry, quarry <laughs> equipment. Let's get to rolling on this. Blast it. Mm-hmm. Money talks. Mm-hmm. Finley began production on the stones with granite from the family quarry. Martin's job wasn't quite over, however. One of the stipulations of the agreement was that Martin act as intermediary of the project. He now needed to find a suitable location preferably high up with no obstructions. Word spreads fast in a small town, and another friend of Finley, Wayne Mullinex, who owned a farm in Elberton, soon got wind of the bizarre request. Finley described what Christian was looking for, about five acres of land, high up. Mullinex said that a chunk of his land fit the bill. It was also located on the highest point in Elberton. Christian considered the property on a trip back to Elberton and made an offer to Mullinex of $5,000. The deal was done, and Christian took the deed to the land which allowed Mullinex to retain grazing rights, 
allowing his cows to freely eat the grass up around the stones. This prevented the need for any maintenance or mowing. In addition, he would also use Molinex's construction company to lay the foundation. After the land deal was done, Christian had Wyatt Martin deed the land over to the county. Yeah, Martin said that Christian was interested in deeding the land to what they assumed would be the longest lasting entity. Like, you know, people die and land gets passed along. So he figured if he deeded it to the county, it would always right. yeah. retain the stones. He also allowed those grazing rights for a lifetime. So they got yep. passed down to Molinex's kids and grandkids and everything. So those cows had it made. Mm, pretty good deal for the It's family. hard to move a cow. Especially a lot, you know, like, it's one thing to move, like, a family out of their home. When you got a mm-hmm. bunch of cows, they put up a real fight. They're very heavy. They don't, they're heavy. They get pissed <laughs> off. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. <laughs> the guidestones were to be flawlessly executed, and the requested astronomical designs of them were intricate, to say the least. To assist, Finley enlisted the help of an astronomer from the University of Georgia. According to Christian's design, the four outer stones needed to be positioned in calculation with the sun's annual migration. The 16-foot stone that would stand in the middle of its four counterparts also had astronomical requirements. On this one, a hole was to be drilled that would allow constant visibility of the North Star, Polaris, in order to allow the new population for which this monument was being built to determine directions. Separately, another opening was to be drilled that perfectly aligned with the sun as it rose during each solstice and equinox. I'm a granite man, not an astronomer. (laughs) That's why you got to get somebody from the University of Georgia to come out and help you with this. You got to be real sure. Atop the four slabs and the center slab, a 25,000 pound capstone was to be placed. This piece was to serve as a calendar. On this, a strategic 7 8 inch opening was to be sandblasted that would allow a beam of sunlight to pass through each day at high noon. When the beam hit the center slab, it would shine on a specific point, indicating the longest and the shortest days of the year. Seems like a hard way to tell what day it is. I'd never know what day. I barely know what day it is now. They all run together. I'm sure shit not be able to read this thing. Hell no. And if the if every the shit goes down, who cares what time it is? <laughs> That's true. Is are you really need to know if it's Monday and, and what what are you gonna you need to watch your shows? What Nobody's, do you need to get to? <laughs> no, you, you're not going to have a job. There's no TV, so you don't Mm-mm. need to know, like, when it's Sunday and HBO, all the HBO stuff comes out. <laughs> That's Also, you know how you know when it's winter? Starts to get cold. Yeah, yes, yeah. The seasons are ever, the longest running calendar of humanity. <laughs> While the astronomy and astrology features of the monument seemed impressive, not everyone was so enamored. Astronomer Loris Magnani of the University of Georgia told Discover Magazine that after visiting the Guidestones, she left underwhelmed. I visited in order to see if they could really function as an observatory, which Stonehenge could have. The Guidestones are an abacus compared to Stonehenge's computer. They're very ordinary. You could do the same thing with concrete in your backyard. Ooh. (laughs) Well, challenge accepted. (laughs) I will get some concrete and a a Dremel, and I'll see how far I can get. I just like this mega burn on the guidestones. It's very ordinary. Yeah, she goes on to say, "You all you have to do is find where the it's drill something thirty four degrees." She like tells you basically how to do it. I'm like, I still think I'd fuck it up. (laughs) Nobody'd see North Star, (laughs) the North Star through that thing. Never. I'd be seeing it in my neighbor's window, and then I'd get called (laughs) a call made on me. The lady's looking through a rock at me again. (laughs) She threw a rock at you? No, she's looking through a rock at me. (laughs) It seemed, though, that the main feature of the stones was not related to the sun, but instead were the guidelines for humanity carved into the outer faces of each of the four pillars. The ten rules were first stenciled onto the slabs and then etched with a sandblaster. They featured eight languages, English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, traditional Chinese, and Russian. A young Chinese-American resident of Elberton helped Martin obtain a translation into Chinese, and employees of the local ambassador's office translated the rules into the other languages. Again, everyone is just so helpful that you give them what we're about to read, which is a strange list, and says like, hey, can you put this in Russian and also Swahili? And someone goes, yeah, okay. Sure, yeah. Also, if you don't speak those languages, 
this is a real opportunity for someone <laughs> to just get a <laughs> message out to fuck to fuck with you. I don't speak any of those languages, Mm-mm. so I Spanish, could pro- I, I could gotcha. I could figure it out Spanish, yeah. But uh, the rest of them, I'm taking your word for it. Yeah. So who knows? Just- we need we need some verification <laughs> that it does in fact. This is what it says on these pillars. Uh, I would love if it didn't. (laughs) The rules read as follows. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Three, unite humanity with a living new language. Four, rule passion, faith, tradition and all things with tempered reason. Number five, protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Six, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Seven, avoid petty laws and useless officials. Number eight, balance personal rights with social duties. Nine, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. And ten, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. For the most part, it sounds on its face quite lovely. Number one is a little... That's where you go... What'd you say? (laughs) If you don't know how many people are in the world, you go, yeah, that's a good number. And then you hear how many people and you go, oh, no, that's that's not. That's a very low number, in fact. But yeah, most of them sound pretty nice on paper. Mm. (laughs) The finished monument was a sight to behold. Each of the four outer granite slabs stood 16 feet, 4 inches tall, were 6 feet, 6 inches wide, and over 1 and a half feet thick. The center slab stood just as high and was 3 and a half feet wide. These five stones were arranged in a paddle wheel design. Resting on top was the capstone, measuring 9 feet, 8 inches long, 6 feet, 6 inches wide, and 1 feet, 7 inches thick. Together, the behemoth rocks weighed almost 240,000 pounds. Yeah, you had to be real sure where you're about to put those. This is a big, big boy. It's huge. Mm-hmm. In addition to the upright stones, a flat stone, an actual grave marker, was placed on the ground a few feet to the west. The slab read, The Georgia Guidestones, center cluster erected March 22nd, 1980. Underneath that phrase, the stones read, Let these be guidestones to an age of reason. Each edge of the square contained translations in Babylonian cuneiform, classical Greek, Sanskrit, and ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Again. I wouldn't know. (laughs) Emojis. It contains it in emojis. It's like wingdings (laughs) on word. That's all I'd be like. Dude, uh, wingdings. This is hieroglyphs, right? (laughs) Wingdings were the original emojis. (laughs) That's true. They were. Damn. I always was so confused by wingdings. As a phone. Com- Dude, if your computer got set on wingdings, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> but I guess if you could get really good at wingdings, you mm-hmm. could have some pretty fun, like, coded messages with friends and stuff if you all knew oh, yeah. what it meant. Secret oh, man. Language. They should have typed all this in wingdings. I know. The international language. I'm, I'm thinking of all the opportunities I missed with my wingdings back in the day. Damn. The slab also contains additional explanations. Reading, astronomic features. One, channel through stone indicates celestial pole. Two, horizontal slot indicates annual travel of sun. Three, sunbeam through capstone marks noontime throughout the year. It also says author, R.C. Christian, in parentheses, a pseudonym, which is misspelled on the slab. Sponsors are listed, a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. It also says time capsule placed six feet below this spot on blank to be open on blank. There are no dates given for the blanks. How much, how pissed would you be <laughs> if you paid all that money and had all the blasts and you can't wipe that out. You can't scratch No, but it you out. can turn an N into an M pretty easily. They never have. They haven't though. <laughs> but yeah, this is why if you are a sandblaster or a tattoo artist, You've got to spell check yourself. Just type it into Word and it'll give you the red squiggly and then you know. That's how I know if I spelled something wrong. One of my favorite things is to look up pictures of tattoos gone wrong. Oh, Where so people good. just don't spell things right or it's just like the apostrophe's in the wrong place or something. Uh, 
and it's like judgment and it's got the wrong gosh yeah, or, yeah. <laughs> oh there's some real good ironic no ones regrets. out there yes no <laughs> no regrets is a great one every yes. time uh but no the ultimate troll is to say i have placed a time capsule here on date and like not put anything and then people are and it should be scratching. opened on i don't know mm-hmm. whatever you want yes did you ever hear about people letting chickens loose in a school and numbering them one through ten but then not numbering like a seven so then as people oh. go through and catching all the chickens they're just searching that's for a seven fun and prank. Exist. That, that's what this strikes me as similar <laughs> did you i think we've talked about ta- time capsules before I've buried several time capsules in my years. Not myself. It was like a school activity or something. Oh, that's fun. I remember at school, we each had to bring something and put it in a time capsule. Or maybe as a class, we decided, like, what are things of this time that people in the future might want to find? I do not remember what we put in them. I hope it was something like (laughs) a a Backstreet Boys cassette or something (laughs) something like that. It's my babysitter club book. Yes. I would love to find a time capsule from a hundred years ago that would be cool Where i would do you lo- find yeah. time capsules the ground i guess you'd have to aren't they should be labeled otherwise they're just buried treasure yeah maybe there's a website i it, i think there's well it's not really buried treasure but isn't that what geocaching mm, is? i was just about to say it sounds like geocaching yeah geocaching um or, or they, that new random knots i was just reading about that the other night maybe yeah that's her it's a uh, I mean, I think everything's bullshit, but there was a <laughs> there was some pretty good evidence that that thing is is not not what people it's it's what you want it to be. If you see yeah. a sign in something, then you see a sign in something. Um, but geocaching, I think I've said this before. How I there was I think it was like two years ago. I wanted I decided I was going to get into geocaching. Mm-hmm. I spent three hours trying to get the screen name I wanted for the geocache <laughs> site. <laughs> And I never did. And you just ran out of patience. Yeah, I wanted to be Kim Kardashian, <laughs> and it <laughs> and like every variation of it, the Kardashians. Like I tried so many. Keeping up with the Kardashians. Yes, I tried all of them, all taken. I'm like, I get it because it's great. So good. Yes, so and then good. I tried like uh, Johnny Cash. I, I, there there oh, was a man. million puns I was going for. They're all taken, and so in the end, it was something like. Christy 69 420 or something no, just like it. i was so over it by the time but our cash friend, money our millionaires the, that's what you gotta do cash money i think that was taken cash damn money it. was taken all of them were taken damn it our friend frank frank Butterfuro does geocaching yes. yeah i love frank. so uh, he's my cousin frank's my cousin he comes to my family thanksgiving frank's my mom everyone's gave him, cousin my mom gave him a punch card for every family event that he came to he got a punch and he got all of his punches so he's an official mckinney now. oh that's nice yeah, I feel like geocaching right now would be maybe a good way to spend your time cuz you get outside and it's probably not around people. I've never I've never found a geocache, but I think yes, to get back to it, a time capsule could be maybe one of the things in a geocache that yeah, you find. Yeah, that's true. I think nowadays you just have to bring you some Clorox wipes, you know, spray something down. Mhm. Mhm. But there's some people out there. Wear a mask. Dunzo. Although the slab refers to a time capsule, the existence of and contents of the time capsule have been up for debate as the slab doesn't indicate when it was buried or when it is to be opened. Martin, when asked by interviewers in the Dark Clouds documentary, cheekily refused to admit whether there was anything located beneath the slab. He just laughs. (laughs) He knows, man. Dude. He knows it all. On March 22, 1980, the monument was finally completed. It was then covered in black plastic to await the grand reveal on the upcoming vernal equinox. It was eventually unveiled to a crowd of 400, including news crews from Atlanta. By all accounts, it was a day of community celebration. Soon, Elberton became a tourist destination, with visitors streaming in from all over the country to witness the mysterious monument for themselves. In 2005, National Geographic Traveler even listed the Guidestones as a feature in the Geotourism Map Guide to Appalachia according to Wired. Still, many were not pleased with what they saw and found what was written out on the guidelines unsettling. Martin told the Dark Clouds filmmakers that once the stones went up, started getting letters from witches, 
started getting monthly magazine from the National Association of Witches, and they tried to take over the Guidestones for a period of time. Landowner Wayne Mullenix had a laissez-faire attitude towards the supposed witches, telling filmmakers, Some people say witches and warlocks have had weddings up there. Well, you know, they a person just like you and I. They want to have their wedding up there? That's up to them. Amen, brother. Dude, that was the best part. It's very laissez-faire attitude. We're just like, well, if that's what they want to do, it's, it's everybody's stones. People can use it for whatever thing they want to use it there for. There you go. Yeah. They're very open. But I wanted to know about the National Association of Witches. How do you join? What's that about? And uh, the monthly magazine? I'm telling you right now, I'm going to get a subscription to this monthly magazine. I'm Sounds upset awesome. I'm not already a member of the National Association of Witches. Sounds great. Yes. And also, he doesn't really sound mad. He's like, well, they started sending me magazines, so I had to read them. I was on the <laughs> toilet. I didn't have anything else. And now, all of a sudden, I'm casting spells. The National Association of Witches, there's got to be some good witch drama that takes place. <laughs> I imagine it's like Us Weekly, but it's like Witch <laughs> Weekly. And it's just like witches. They're just like us. And you see witches shopping at the grocery store, at the farmer's market, mm-hmm. taking their dogs out <laughs> for a walk. <laughs> Who wore it best? This witch or this celebrity? Always Cloak. the witch. Compa- <laughs> comparing cloaks. <laughs> or in the back, maybe there's classifieds. Oh. Martin also began receiving calls from people he considered friends, asking him why he was doing the devil's work, according to Wired. A local minister warned everyone that the occult would begin flocking to their town soon in order to commit human sacrifices at the monument. When Charlie Clamp... The man hired to sample the guidelines for a new humanity on the stones revealed he had been distracted while working by strange music and disjointed voices. Rumors of a cult bankrolling the project began to circulate. Dibs on Charlie Clamp as a fake name. That's such a good <laughs> fake name. That's to be my geocaching name. Charlie Clamp. Charlie Clamp. Charlie Clamp's the one that misspelled pseudonym, too. So. <laughs> Charlie can't. He, Charlie Clamp ain't worried about spelling. It's, well, if he's hearing strange music and disjointed voices, he didn't have time to check if it's an N or an M. He's just well, trying probably, to get out of there. He was going to do an M, but he got scared. He spooked oh, off, ran away. There you go. There you go. There it is. Yeah. So the townsfolk, no one knew who had bankrolled this whole monument except for mm-hmm. Martin and Finley. So mm-hmm. all these rumors started circulating like, who could have put this up? There were even, like, those that started thinking Finley and Martin were behind it. Mm. And it was just all this drama that they did it just to to get attention on themselves. They had to take lie detector tests to prove that they didn't. Elberton wasn't having it. They weren't effing around. Well, and Finley didn't even know his name. He just knew a guy. Right, right. Others were less concerned with witches and cults and more concerned with the implication of the set population number referred to in guide number one. With a world population of 4.5 billion at the time, how would mankind achieve a population of a half a billion? This essentially meant 8 out of 9 people would have to be eliminated, a number that today is closer to 12 out of 13, with the current population of 7 billion. Would it be mass genocide? Birth control? Eugenics? Soon R.C. Christian would publish a book that would explain his thinking a bit more. Published under the name Robert Christian via a small publishing company out of Iowa, R.C. published Common Sense Renewed, in which he expanded on some of his Ten Commandments. Dark Clouds quotes his book as saying, We have controlled disease, but we have not regulated our numbers. The book also laments the excessive environmental pollution and proposes that a few generations of single-child families may be a solution to the then-current state of things. This rang true with guide number two. Guide reproduction wisely. I'm part of the problem. (laughs) Yeah, we have babies over here. (laughs) I'm about to have a dual child family. Well, no, it said it for diversity and fitness. So you have fit children. Ah, Uh, Yeah, we try and go on walks, I guess. (laughs) The other day, Ella was just stomping around the house going, exercise, exercise, exercise. So we try and get it where we can. Yes, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Guide number three furthered the fear of local ministers, as it referenced humanity learning a new language. These God-fearing Christians knew the book of Revelations warns that a universal tongue and one world government are sure signs of the coming of the Antichrist. Mm -mm. According to conspiracy theorists, some of the guides seem to make reference to a new world order, 
referencing a world court. Still, more than half of the guidelines seemed logical and even inspiring, albeit new agey, reminding everyone to prize truth with beauty and love and to leave room for nature. Sinisterhood will be right back after these messages. Charlotte's Web is the world's most trusted hemp extract, and now you can use the code CREEPY for 15% off their entire selection of amazing products, excluding bulk and bundles. You can choose from a selection of topical skincare products, gummies, and traditional oils, all made to support you day-to-day, moment-to-moment. My personal fave is the mint chocolate hemp oil. It helps me feel calm and manage my everyday stresses. I am still loving the CBD Medic Eczema Therapy Medicated Ointment. As soon as I put it on, I feel relief from the itching, and I also got the Sleep Gummies with Melatonin. They help me have sound quality sleep and regular sleeping cycles. Plus, they taste good, and I get to eat gummies before bed. All Charlotte's Web products are free of eight major allergens, they're not tested on animals, they're gluten-free, and their topical products are formulated without synthetic fragrances, artificial colors or dyes, sulfates, or GMOs. Speaking of animals, Charlotte's Web even offers products to support your pets. My fur babies, Kate and Biddy, told me how much they're enjoying the CBD chews for senior dogs, which are designed to enhance their brain function and support their central nervous system. Anything for the fur babies. A CBD routine is a simple way to ease some of life's day-to-day stresses. So try the world's most trusted hemp extract by going to charlottesweb.com and entering code CREEPY for 15% off. We all know we all like true crime. Yes, ma'am. We all know we love escape rooms. What's not to love? We sure, sure know we love TV. Yep. What do you get when you put all three of those things together? I think I can guess. What? Hunt a killer. It is Hunt a killer, which has been described as a true crime themed escape room mixed with a TV show. It is. It is a true crime inspired murder mystery box that's delivered right to your doorstep every month. Each six box season is referred to a season and each box is an episode. And right now you can receive 20% off your first box by visiting huntakiller.com and entering the code creepy. Each box is full of clues, documents, and evidence that will help develop the story and allow you to eliminate a suspect after each box. It's a super fun and unique way to spend date night or a game night with friends. You and your friends can each get a box and hunt the killer together over Zoom. There is also an amazing and active online community where you have access to share your theories, help each other out, make new friends, fall in love, who knows? Do all the things. So if you love true crime, mystery, and having lots of fun, visit huntakiller.com today and enter code CREEPY to receive 20% off your first box. Happy hunting. The strange circumstances surrounding the erection of the Guidestones, their mysterious benefactor, and their bizarre inscriptions left many wondering why they had been built and what their true meaning was. Unsurprisingly, the topic became a field day for conspiracy theorists. In 2005, one such theorist and author of the Resistance Manifesto, Mark Dice, Petition that the guidelines be smashed into a million pieces. Dice was convinced R.C. Christian was a high-ranking official of a secret Luciferian society that was part of the New World Order. Cabal of powerful elite that are conspiring to rule the world through a totalitarian one-world government. Dice told Wired, The elite are planning to develop successful life extension technology in the next few decades that will nearly stop the aging process And they fear that with the current population of Earth so high, the masses will be using the resources that the elite want for themselves. The Guidestones are the New World Order's Ten Commandments. They're also a way for the elite to get a laugh at the expense of the uninformed masses, as their agenda stands as clear as day, and the zombies don't even notice it. Damn, Mark Dice coming in hot. Mark Dice, Charlie Clamp, those are such good (laughs) I think it's just normal first name noun last name yeah that's yes 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 mark dice is not effing around no no dice isn't the only one convinced the new world order is behind the guidestones in 2008 the slabs were defaced for the first time when vandals used polyurethane paint to scrawl messages like jesus will beat you satanist and no one world government polyurethane is really hard to get off apparently from my research it's not just like regular graffiti paint so Mm -hmm. they really wanted this to last for a long time up there and these were expert vandals because you knew that like if they knew not Mm -hmm. to just spray paint it because you could spray the spray paint off they Mm -hmm. used the sticky stuff Mm Hmm. 
Others believe the group R.C. Christian represented was the notoriously secret Rosicrucians. Developed in the early 17th century, Rosicrucianism is a spiritual and cultural movement with beliefs centered heavily around nature, the universe, and the spiritual realm, all tenets represented on the guidestones. A phrase also etched into the stones is, Let these be guidestones to an age of reason. Thomas Paine, author of The Age of Reason, was also thought to be a member of the Order of the Rosy Cross. His controversial best-selling book argued for the philosophical position of deism. I I like this theory. Haven't I, we heard of them before in the Oak Islands? Yeah, they're they're linked to Freemasons a lot. Mm-hmm. A lot of secret societies developed around the same time. And the um, Order of the Solar Temple split off. It was like a split off from a split off from a split off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Seattle radio personality and conspiracy theorist Jay Widener believes the name R.C. Christian is an homage to the society's founder, Freighter CRC, who later went by Christian Rosencruz. Widener believes that the purpose of the Guidestones is to instruct survivors of a global catastrophe on how to rebuild civilization. Furthermore, Widener believes the global event. Furthermore, Widener believes the global event will be orchestrated by the Rosicrucians themselves and that it actually began with the 2009 financial crisis. At the time of the financial crisis, Widener stated that this would lead to shortages of oil and food supplies, mass riots, and ethnic wars, culminating in the final event on December 21st, 2012. Did he accidentally spell 2012 wrong and it should have been 2020? (laughs) Dude, thought the same thing. Like, man, if he uh, bumped that up by about eight years, he'd really have something there. It's like, you're not wrong. You're just early. (laughs) You're just off by about eight years or so. Yeah, but um that it's certainly in in these trying times rings true mm-hmm. as for martin he told wired that half cock theories like widener's are the sort of thing that makes me want to tell people everything i know quickly adding but i can't tell i made a promise see this makes me think and we'll get to another theory in a minute but i don't think it says, um, I think this man might be a little more normal than everyone thinks. Mm-hmm. Because I think Martin is kind of gives clues here and there. He can't about, help himself. Yes. He, I'm telling you, you just, I would have blurted it out by now because I couldn't have helped myself. <laughs> but he just like, this, this idiot. I just mm-hmm. want to tell everybody what I know. And then he references, I told him I'd never reveal who his family was. You know, so Mm -hmm. it's like he doesn't say who the cult that he is with is, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, so and I don't think he's one to use family and cult interchangeably. No, I think he means his kinfolk. Yes, yes, yes. In a 1981 issue of UFO Report, Atlantic psychic Nani Batchelder predicted the Guidestones would reveal their true purpose in the next 30 years, meaning 2010 would have been the year its secrets were unleashed. The magazine also stated that if viewed from above, the monument forms an X, implying it may serve as a type of landing site for something out of this world. You see the Tic Tacs go over there and land on it. Nani Batchelder's fun, too. It's great. Again, I wonder what all these people, when the day comes, when 2020 comes, and you're like, well, nothing happened, or December 21st, 2012. Is it like a cult leader where they always just make excuses and keep pushing it back? So you don't have to really own up to the fact that you were really wrong about this. You have to be like God Salvation Church where he's like, I'm so sorry. I was wrong. <laughs> Everyone should go home. Goodbye. And That's the only inside. way. You have to own it. You have to admit that you were you wrong. Won't. You can keep the cowboy hats. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Perhaps the most popular theory as to the true meaning of the Guidestones is that they are there to help rebuild a devastated civilization. Author Brad Meltzer points out that the monument was built in 1979 at the very height of the Cold War. Meltzer posits that the stones may have been intended for any survivors of a nuclear World War III. He goes on to say that the controversial first guide stating the population must be kept under 500 million might not be as bad as it seems, but rather the authors may have assumed the majority of the population would have already been decimated by the war. And Wyatt Martin talks about this in the the Dark Clouds documentary because he said, 
you have to understand, you know, Russia and the U.S. had nuclear weapons pointed at each other, and they were ready to go. And mm-hmm. this was right. Carter, you know, that becomes Reagan takes over. He was trying to calm things down. Then Reagan starts to do more uh, the Cold Wars where they're, you know, going into other countries and, like, setting up coups and stuff like that. And I think it was just heightening and heightening and heightening in the late 70s. So, I mean, it makes sense that people were like, well, this is going to happen. We may get blasted by Russia. Mm-hmm. And one of the languages on the Guidestones is Russian. That's true. Still, others are convinced the site is nothing more than a stone altar for devil worshippers and pagans to conduct their sacrifices and witchcraft. There are even rumors that if you point both of your arms at the monument, with one palm facing up and the other down, that you will receive a direct psychic message from the stones. Well, we're going first. Well, we, qu- yes. <laughs> Post quarantine vacation, we're driving to the stones. I want to mm-hmm. hear who did this. Yes. <laughs> What's this all about? Uh, that was the 90s. So everybody was like, we was the devil worshippers. <laughs> In my neighborhood, at least, you're like, what is that weird old car burned out? Devil worshippers. Devil worshippers. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In 2003, R.C. Christian called John Finley and offered to reveal his identity. Finley, who by then had served as Elberton's mayor, refused the information. According to his son, Joe Finley Jr., he died not knowing the man's real name. His family destroyed all documents and items related to the Guidestones, including the original wooden model Christian had presented him. Man, that takes some willpower. Yeah. Or, or maybe maybe fear. True. Of just being like, you know, what I don't know can't hurt me. You That's know? true. Just and if ignorance you're like- is bliss. They can't hurt my kids. They can't yeah. hold me to nothing. And and especially destroying the papers. You know, you can't mm-hmm. get robbed. Like, nobody's going to break in the house and mm-hmm. steal them. I would have kept the model. For sure. <laughs> Put it in, like, a glass case or, like, a plastic, you know, plastic yeah. case. Stick it in the attic. Bury it. Do something with it. Yeah. Time capsule. Put there it in go. the time. Maybe that's what's in the time capsule. Oh, a tiny version of itself is <laughs> in the time capsule. And then inside of that, there's a tiny time capsule with an even <laughs> tinier version oh, inside. Oh, it just keeps going and going. It's like Russian nesting doll. See? And now, it's, <laughs> back it's to the Russian. Russians. <laughs> and we are actually in a time capsule of an even bigger Georgia oh, Guidestone. Oh, God. Jeez. In the sky. Wow. Wyatt Martin, on the other hand, maintained a relationship with Christian up until the latter's death in 2005. They often wrote to one another and talked of family updates and health issues that they were suffering. When Christian was in town, he would often call Martin so the two could meet for lunch. One day when the letters stopped, Martin wondered if his mysterious old friend might have passed. A few months later, Christian's son called Martin and confirmed his father's death. Oh, yeah, he had these, uh, you know, letters that he wrote back and forth. I was like, oh, I mm-hmm. had surgery. Oh, my knee's they been were acting up. They were, they were pen pals. They were. They were buddies. They would, And they'd get together and stuff. Obviously, his son knew that they had a relationship to where he needed to inform him, like my mm-hmm. dad passed and everything. While Martin has never revealed the true identity of R.C. Christian or his family, there was one promise he did not keep. Although Martin had sworn to Christian he would destroy all documents and records of the project, he actually maintained them all in his garage inside of an IBM typewriter case. When documentary filmmakers convinced Martin to open the box, he revealed it was filled to the brim with papers, purportedly related to the Guidestones. He showed letters from R.C. Christian he had received over the years, but attempted to hide the postmark with his thumb. However, the cameraman was able to get an angle into the box and see that the return address was from Fort Dodge, Iowa. Another letter was sent to a Mr. Merriman, care of Mr. Martin. Who was this Mr. Merriman, and who lived in Fort Dodge, Iowa? They finally get him to, the documentary filmmaker said, you know, did you keep it? And he goes, yeah, I was going to write a book, but I'm too old to do it now. And they said, well, can we see it? And he goes, it's out in the garage under a bunch of furniture. And they're like, can we move the furniture? He goes, (laughs) yeah, it's fine. I don't care. And they go out digging for it, and they take it, and they open it up, and he goes, these are all the papers for the guides to, oh wait, that's my tax return. Hold on. And he's like moving the papers around. But he, you can see it's kind of, some people on the internet were, took umbrage with the documentary filmmaker's treatment of Mr. Martin, because you can tell he, he kind of wants to show it, but he doesn't really want to reveal the identity. So he's very, you know, they bullied him letter. into it. Yeah. Well, there's like a postmark. He's got his thumb. I mean, it's clear. It's obvious that he specifically held his thumb over that. Mm-hmm. And cause the return address, he's also trying to kind of hide or, but anyhow, the document, the cameraman like zooms in and they like, you know, of course, turn the image upside down and like show that it's well, really, of course you know, they're going to do room. that. 
Yeah, they want to sneak it, but I'm he's... surprised he uh, he let him in there after being so staunch about not mm-hmm. revealing the identity and everything. I'm kind of surprised he would he even would admit that he had the papers or that and he it, even kept him. That's true, and I mean he. I think he. It it was like he for almost forgot about him because he's like, oh yeah, they're out there. You know, the the filmmaker said, oh well, people said that you kept them, and he's like, well yeah, I did. I think they're out in the garage. So it's like he kept them, but it forgot. But I think he accidentally also did not intend to reveal as much information because he shows another letter that says it's dated like 1998 and rc christian goes well you know it's hard for me being 73 years old or whatever and from there they can match up like how old this part he would have been when he came in to get the yeah how old he would have been letter was dated 1978 no 1998 1998 and And it said 78 yeah well they the calculation was he was born in 1920 i can't remember the exact numbers but he, you know, he said that, so they're like, oh, well, we figured out it's like Fort Dodge, and the person would have had to have been born this year, and they're like, what year did he die? And Wyatt Martin's like, well, I'm not going to tell you that. And they're like, well, can you tell us if it was after the year 2000? He's like, yeah, I'll tell you. It was a couple years after the year 2000. Hmm. And so then that's how they kind of figured out it was the guy died around 2005. Mm-hmm. Some believe that Dr. Herbert H. Kirsten, a doctor in Iowa, was the infamous R.C. Christian. Kirsten represented this small group of loyal Americans, who included Mr. Robert Merriman, another citizen of Fort Dodge. Their names combined, Robert and Kirsten, an ancient version of Christian, meant to some guide soon enthusiasts the men were responsible for the famous monument. When the Dark Clouds filmmakers interviewed historians in Fort Dodge, they confirmed that yes, the two men did know each other. But disturbingly, the town knew something else about the two men. Merriman was friends with the inventor of the transistor, Dr. William Shockley. A Nobel Prize winner, Shockley was widely panned for his views that African Americans were genetically inferior and that low IQ individuals should be paid to have themselves sterilized. Apparently, Dr. Kirsten and Merriman also subscribed to these beliefs. The Iowa historian interviewed in the documentary said that Dr. Kirsten was racist to his fingertips and even ostracized from a local country club for espousing white supremacist beliefs. So, yeah, they kind of track down the... They go to Iowa. They track down these two men. They confirm that they were... And then they also talk to... They figure out, like, based on the press that the book came out on was made in the same area. Mm -hmm. And they narrow it down that this guy, that Kirsten was born in 1920, died in 2005. On his gravestone, it says, Physician and Conservationist. Mm. And although... He was a uh, builder of the guide stones, <laughs> stone builder. <laughs> and um, also, even though he was Catholic, he spoke to like like they said, at the country club, people were like, uh, you guys should get the fuck out of here with that. Spoke about how there should be birth control for like low IQ or inferior beings, like basically meaning coded black language. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was coded language. And then, not so quoted, I mean, Shockley was, uh, he won a Nobel Prize, and then after he came out, he's like, I'm a Nobel Prize winner. Anyway, here's a bunch of racist stuff. They were yeah. like, oh, no, you can you can go away with all that. Mm-hmm. So they just happened to know him and be friends with him. So I think, uh, and then his book, the the accompanying Guidestone book does espouse some of the things that Kirsten and Merriman were known for talking about in the Yes, circles. and there's a website, Vans Hardware, that's oh, yeah. one of like the leading conspiracy theorists of the Guidestones. Mm-hmm. And I was reading it earlier, and there's a lot of information there about how Kirsten was directly involved in the KKK, mm-hmm. had I think his grandfather or great grandfather was perhaps a grand wizard. So mm-hmm. there's definitely a lot of um racist tendencies and beliefs in his heritage and family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like David Duke connections, things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So was the small group of Americans responsible for the Stones really just racist men from Iowa? Or were they put up by a secret society intent on creating a new world order? Are the purpose of the Guidestones to help survivors of a catastrophic global event rebuild civilization, put there by either the Rosicrucians or a group concerned about an impending World War III? Perhaps they're just serving as a docking station for alien aircraft or a place for witches and warlocks to gather under the moon and stars. As it stands, Wyatt Martin appears to be the only person still alive that may have answers to these haunting questions, and who R.C. Christian really is. Martin told Wired, 
All I can tell you is that Mr. Christian always seemed a very decent and sincere fellow to me. It appears, however, that will be all of the information Martin is willing to provide. Telling Discover Magazine, They could put a gun to my head and kill me. I will never reveal his name. I think if they kill you, you can't. Yeah, but I will show you a box of documents that I have in my garage. <laughs> that has his name printed on them <laughs> and also his address. Yes. And that was the other thing is it had the return address of like whatever street, like mm. 123 Main Street or whatever. And they're like, we looked it up. This guy lives here and he's been writing you letters. <laughs> Martin revealed in a 2013 interview with Discover Magazine that he did finally destroy the documents related to the massive project, saying... Last year, I went with a few friends over to an old bridge on Lake Onkany, and we dumped all correspondence associated with the guidestones into a metal barrel and burned them. Then we poured the ashes into the lake. It'll never be known. And that's what he wanted. He always said, if you want to keep people interested, you can only let them know so much. It's like what you do when you break up. You have a bad breakup. Yeah. It's like uh, friends, Phoebe and Rachel and Monica. I'll put the stuff into the barrel, and then the hot firefighters show up, and it turned out for the best. <laughs> it works out. Leanne and I did that. I can't remember if it was for her 30th birthday or my 30th birthday. We sat in the backyard with a notebook, and we wrote things that we were going to leave behind in the last decade and burn them into the fire, and it was very relaxing. Fire is very cathartic. It's very, it's very healing. Probably don't dump it into the lake. That's not good. That's chemicals that you just burned up old typewriter fluids and whatnot. Well, it's just ashes, right? I don't I know. Guess. I don't <laughs> know how burning stuff works. I don't think you're ever. I mean, if to you dump, dump if you dump ashes from a body into a lake, I feel like I guess that's back to you can your face. People do that all the you're time. To, well, yeah, people dump things everywhere all the time, but you're not supposed to. People scatter uh, ashes all over the place. I told you about that lady at Sea Dog that I let her dump her grandma off the boat, right? Oh, really? No, that's she, nice, she came though. up and she she had this this little satchel with her and she's like can i have one ticket to the speedboat ride and i was Aww. like sure and it was like around sunset and she's like i have this bag and it has ashes in it and would it be okay and i was like stop stop talking don't yeah, stop, just stop, do stop. it just do, I it, said, just do it i can't i'm not gonna tell you what you can and can't do i'll say if you throw anything over the boat it's a 500 hundred dollar fine from the coast guard it may be five thousand i don't know but what i will tell you is that behind the captain they can't see what's going on there's mm -hmm. a lot of wind and maybe your bag flies open and oopsie who knows what happens yeah. all i'm saying is just don't tell me and that's she was usually like, what well, people do like, my grandmother is actually and i was like stop 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 <laughs> just go get on the boat and i don't care don't like, take I a get what you're saying lady mm, sh 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 don't take do you a get what i'm saying if you want to take a last photo with your grandmother before boarding we have a photographer that'll shoot <laughs> the picture with the skull hold the satchel up by your face yeah most people are cool about it because it is illegal to dump human remains including ashes but um most people are like it's who's gonna know it's like ashes. i said just, i'm not you're i'm not it. saying you're allowed to throw anything but no. if it slips these opens i've got an aquatic cemetery in my front yard so that's true come <laughs> at me so, somebody messaged us that the fish are very good fertilization and you should plant something on top of it oh and well. then New life grows from the old. Yeah, that's why people want to have natural burials. Uh -huh. Like Nate, six feet under. Make me a tree. Well, so what do we think? I think it was Kirsten and Merriman, but I don't think they were working alone. That's what I think. Yeah. I think it was Kirsten and Merriman, and they were also Rosicrucians. Yeah, they were part of some society. That makes sense with all the... And it, and they talk about the Rosicrucians in the Dark Clouds documentary as well. And then, like, the research we've done. It lines up mm -hmm. the the tenets that they espouse and then also the names and the RC and things like that. So I don't think it's... I mean, it's still going on. There are still people that are practicing and that are in that society. So I don't think that it's uh, unrealistic that they could have been a part of it. Right. And it's... From what I've read, it's very secretive. No one really knows who's in it and who's not. But I've also read there's a lot of racist history with Ooh. the Rosicrucians. So um, I think that even if maybe that wasn't, uh, and I'm not saying that's the primary focus of the Rosicrucians, but it sounded like these guys were uh, were pretty racist, mm -hmm. also involved in a powerful secret society like the Rosicrucians and had a ton of money and mm -hmm. said, here we go. Let's erect this thing. And I think because they were both f 
just men and families. That's why it didn't seem that weird to Martin. Because they're just like, he's just like a guy that he doesn't live too far away that he sees still and everything. And he's like, oh, this is just some man that's got a bunch of money. And I might not agree with his beliefs, but he has every right, just like those witches, to get up there and do what he wants. (laughs) I think so. And I bet you that R.C. Christian, I think Kirsten didn't uh didn't share the rosicrucian part with him oh you don't think that martin knew that part correct i would think he may have said oh it's a gentleman's club you know it's a fraternal it's a mason kind of it's a rotary club kind of thing but i don't think he was like we're in the fraternal order of the rosicrucians right i don't think he would have told him all the details no 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 i think that's rule one is you don't tell someone when you're a member of a secret society (laughs) i do wonder why he called finley and offered to reveal his identity I Do you think know. he was nearing his own death and felt a sense of, like, wanting to unburden himself? Maybe. Or maybe he caught wind that Finley was ill or older mm. and, and maybe it was like, this will help him. Maybe he's holding on and this will help him go easy. I don't know. But I think that the uh, there was definitely, while they were in the secret society, I think that it was also motivated partially by the the escalation of the Cold War and the tensions and thinking mm. that, we very could very well could have a nuclear event and then also racism. Yes. <laughs> Due to yeah. what is it, guide reproduction wisely. I think we know what that means. Guide reproduction wisely. Um It says for fitness and diversity. Fitness, I think, is the implication of the people with low IQ because Shockley said mm-hmm. anybody with the IQ under a hundred should be given some money to be sterilized. Which is protect horrifying. people and nations with fair laws and just courts protect certain people who yeah that's, i mean uh, that's can be sedative today avoid petty laws and useless officials just makes me think of ron swanson because i've been watching a lot of old parks and rec <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of these things at first blush seem innocent but if you really kind of uh pair it with perhaps the intention behind it or who was writing it and what they believed then it takes on a brand new meaning yeah and if you were in his book the the book he wrote that accompanied it the mm-hmm. there was some stuff in there that was like oh yeah yeah and rosicrucians are very um based on nature and like the spiritual realm and believe that um not everyone is privy to it and it will be revealed to them and stuff so i think that a lot these kind of read to me as tenants that are very Rosicrucian, and then perhaps um, mixed with uh, racism. Yeah. So, that, and it seems like these two men kind of fell into that category. Yeah, and you know, I mean, even just because you're part of a secret society doesn't mean you do it right or the the original way. You know, your own beliefs are going to creep in. So if you're uh, subscribing sure. to the Shockley uh, ideal system, um, it makes sense to marry the two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well... I just have to say, we just agreed on we something that I'm was like, a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Shocking. This was the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what, this is one where I was like, oh, man, I don't have like an exciting, you know, dun, dun, dun. I'm like, yeah, some racist guys. Yeah. I mean, but, sometimes uh, it is just that simple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the simplest answer is is often the the most correct. That's what it is. I, I did fall down an Illuminati rabbit hole last night, though. It's a dangerous game. <laughs> Anytime we do on Instagram, like hashtag Illuminati, Illuminati, we'll get like four or five bots that are like, "Do you want to join the Illuminati? Uh, Follow yeah. me." I was like, "Is that how? That's how you join? That's you just how follow you get in? Oh, an Instagram account?" I thought you had to be best friends with Beyonce. No, nope. sorry. But if that is it, I will join in a oh, minute. Oh hell yeah, I love her. I've been listening to a lot of Beyonce lately. Oh man, her uh, the remix, the Megan The Stallion uh, Savage remix with Beyonce came on my running playlist the other day. Man, that got me up a hill in the heat of the day. Do you, do you like it? I do. I like it. I can't get behind it. I don't know why. Oh really? Yeah, I'm not. For I'm so, not that I, crazy about it. I get my head down and I just run into it. Man, I felt powerful. I don't. Uh, I've been listening. It's not new, but um, her homecoming album is just. Awesome. If you want to get, if you want to feel all the feels, get pumped up, also sob, also <laughs> just be like, hell yes, queen, and just put that on or watch it. It's That's true. It's phenomenal. She's all, all hell Beyonce. That's the monument we need. Yes. <laughs> Man, yes. We need and- to, someone in Elberton 
get a 20 foot granite slab and just carve a beautiful statue of Beyonce out of it. And then come put it in my front yard. The nuclear fallout comes. That's all that's left. And that's all that needs to be left. <laughs> yes, exactly. If that's all we have after a nuclear fallout, then you know what? That's how things start anew. Life <laughs> right. starts anew. <laughs> we'll rebuild. After that, just like my fish in the front yard. That's right. Well, let us know what you guys think. If you've seen the Georgia Guide since, I, I know for a fact that several of our listeners have from messages and stuff we've gotten in the past mm -hmm. about doing this subject so send us pictures of them let us know um how how impressive and and majestic they were up close because the pictures look pretty cool mm -hmm. if you've been invited to a witch or warlock wedding as a <sighs> maid not of honor just, not just there anywhere anywhere <laughs> please yes. send photos please Well, we love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content like our weekly mix bags where we share three of our favorite things of the week. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll also be hopping in occasionally and hosting monthly Q&As where you can ask us all your burning questions. For our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of conversion fees. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon in the top right corner to join today. Make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy? I'm on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and I'm on Instagram at Christy and Wallace. Heather? I am on Instagram at Heather vs. the World and on Twitter at MCK vs. the World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey everybody, thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Allison Dunlap. Avery Acasso. Millie Schushman. Jenna Wise Hudak. Jamie Keck. Stephanie. Heather Sweeney. Christy Stogner. Savannah Orndoff. Nikki B. Jessica I. Lauren Novakowski. Kate Garden. Denise Collett. Zoe Robertson. Rachel Hayenga. Jalissa. Ellery Barnes. Tom Heal. We are here to say. Happy birthday to Kelly Baxter. Happy birthday, Kelly Baxter. Your boyfriend thinks very highly of you and sent us some very nice emails about you. So happy birthday and welcome to the Patreon. Carrie Miller. Katie Reist. Rachel Irvine. Rachel Case. And Sadie Skeels. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We really, really appreciate it. We know this is a difficult time and we sincerely appreciate your support. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> Sin